Uh, do you have this share screen button at the bottom? Yes. Yeah, so you should be fine. All right. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to another session of Philosophy of Freedom. Today, we're doing Chapter 9, The Idea of Freedom. And uh, Jeff has volunteered to introduce the chapter to us. So go ahead, Jeff. And you should be able to share your screen, but if not, let me know. Yeah, first thing, actually, I have a little um, presentation. I'll share the link in the notes. Anyone wants to either follow or just have his reference uh, for it later. Um, so yeah, I will share my screen. Um, oh dear, okay, oh, here it is, okay. Okay, so can someone confirm if they see um, like a presentation? It looks like for some, uh, yeah, if you were just trying to share that one window, what we see, I think, is your whole desktop, but that's fine if that's what you intend. Okay, you, is the first thing like an Alex Gray painting? Or yes. Man? Yeah, okay. Okay, it's chapter nine, The Idea of Freedom. Um, it's in a in a sense, um, it's kind of like in the whole um, you know the the whole purpose, the whole central idea of the book kind of all comes together in this chapter. I mean, well, of course, all the buildup had to happen. It couldn't just have started here, but um, so I will just get into it. I have various elements I've sketched out here. So the first thing I want to go into is um, to say that chapter nine is in what Steiner calls the soul mood of logicism, right? I, I'm taking that idea from his lecture series, Human and Cosmic Thought, where he, ha he outlines um, 12 worldviews and seven soul moods. And uh, as I said, this chapter is in the soul mood of logicism. That's one of seven. In fact, this is a, a 14 chapter book. So we have the seven soul moods, um, you know, he, he basically, the first half of the book, chapters one through seven, go through those seven soul moods, and then now we're in part two, so it goes back up through them again. So we have the lo this logicism here in chapter nine. It also was the soul mood of chapter six, if you want to look at that as reference. And I, I'm going to start out just here with um, just a few little sentences, just ex excerpting um how Steiner defined logicism in that lecture series, I said, Human and Cosmic Thought. Um, he says, there is another world's outlook mood. Its representative in the constellation of idealism is Hegel. The special mark of logicism consists in its enabling the soul to connect thoughts, concepts, and ideas with one another as when in looking at an organism, one comes from the eyes to the nose and the mouth and regards them all as belonging to each other. So Hegel arranges all the concepts that he can lay hold of into a great concept organism, a logical concept organism. Hegel was simply able to seek out everything in the world that can be found as thought, to link together thought with thought and to make an organism of it, logicism. One can develop logicism in the constellation of idealism, as Hegel did. One can develop it, as Fichte did, in the constellation of psychism. And one can develop it in other constellations. Logicism is, again, something that passes like a planet through the 12 zodiacal signs. So anyway, that's just a good opening idea. I think it contextualizes this chapter as well as chapter 6. Um, and I have just a few extra resources here. And just actually my own clarification, uh, you know, this logicism, I'm linking to the, the big concept of logos, right? We, we have all of our different sciences, like psychology, sociology, philology, archeology, span you know, those all end with that, that logos word. Now, of course, in the modern context, that becomes very um, you know, kind of abstracted, right? Science of this, science of that. But, but yeah, this re really, if we get into the logos of these various fields of knowledge, it's it's a very like what Steiner is getting at here. This logicism, this deeper thinking process, this deeper connection of all the parts of something, so that you can see the whole. So, anyways, that's that's just kind of giving us a 
kind of a, a soul mood for, for this chapter. Um, now this in where in the, the, the second edition, you know, the, 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 the Robert, not Robert, what's his name? Wilson, I forget his first name now, Wilson, um, Michael, Michael Wilson, the translator, the, this, this is the, his translation is of the second edition. The first edition was in 1894, the second edition in 1918, am I doing the right math? And the, in the second edition, in this chapter, chapter nine, I believe Steiner does something that he doesn't do anywhere else. And that is, he actually rewrites the beginning of the chapter. You know, he adds a whole, a whole series of paragraphs, at least a page, a page and a half worth um, at the beginning. And I say he doesn't do that. I don't think he does that elsewhere. What he does is he adds addendums in the second edition, you know, the 1918 addendum to chapter whatever. He gives an, an extra example just to clarify that chapter. But here he actually rewrites or you know, he, he adds a, a whole a bunch of fresh writing. And, um, and this is critically, critically important to this whole chapter, this whole book. Uh, and I'm going to read some of the excerpts from this rewritten beginning. And I'm going to uh, kind of put it into a bit of a context here. So the basically um, what he what the, what he's doing in this new writing is he's giving this grand anatomy of the human being in terms of um, like anyway, it, it'll link us back to the exceptional state of thinking. It'll link us into where we're going with with. Uh, you know, moral activity in, in this part of the book, but to understand, and I can see why he added it, because I, I'm sure he had this in mind when he wrote the first edition, but I, I guess it's like anybody, you know, something that's so obvious to us, we never even think to stop and explain how we, how we got there. We just take it as obvious and we just, we just go about whatever we're doing, but he actually stopped in the second edition and realized people needed an explanation here. So, the, what, what he explained was this idea of this, this dual human being, right? Um, and, and actually, he, let, me, let me get right into the excerpt here. So, so this is Steiner. So when we observe our thinking, we live during this observation directly within a self-supporting spiritual web of being. Intuition is the conscious experience in pure spirit of a purely spiritual content. The recognition of this truth of the intuitive essence of thinking will once succeed in clearing the way for an insight into the psyche physical organization of man. One will see that this organization can have no effect on the essential nature of thinking. The essence, which is active in thinking, has a twofold function. First, it represses the activity of the human organization. Secondly, it steps into its place. What happens in this organization through the thinking has indeed nothing to do with the essence of thinking, but it has a great deal to do with the arising of the ego consciousness out of this thinking. Thinking in its own essential nature, um, sorry, my eyes just lost my place. Thinking in its own essential nature certainly contains the real I or ego, but it does not contain the ego consciousness. Out of the latter flow our acts of will, we can gain insight into the connections between thinking, conscious eye, and active will only by observing first how an active will issues from the human organization. Now, I think one of the really important things about this, at least for us to get clarity, is this is, um, you know, you know, here, of course, in this book, you know, throughout all of Steiner's writings, we have kind of an, and, and I'm not sure how this plays out in German, I'm sure it's similar, we have this ambiguity around the word ego, right? Sometimes he's using the word ego and it kind of means this thing over here. Sometimes he says it and it means this other thing. And the thing and the other thing in this case, like we, we can talk about the true ego or the true self, like in this sense that he's talking about the spirit, the spiritual being, you know, this the part that participates the activity of thinking, you know, that's what the true spirit self does versus what we commonly use as the word ego, which is kind of this, um, you know, I, I guess like a psychological term or, you know, kind of the idea of the false self or kind of, a, you know, someone not being true to their, themselves in one form or another. So we have these, this ambiguity of two uses of the word ego, and he's really clarifying it here. So basically he has the true self over here, the false ego, which he relates to the psyche physical organization, as he says in this passage, and and that and I, I think as he says elsewhere, probably riddles of philosophy. I'm 
forgetting all the, the points here, but it's like that, that like, uh, let me say it the other way around. The, the, the pure form of thinking is not dependent on the body, right? It's not dependent on this psyche, physical organization he's talking about. That pure thinking, that exceptional state is the one thing, but this whole other experience we have of ourselves and the world, we're largely grounded in in that ego consciousness right the, the, that second sense of ego i said so so anyways what he's laying out here is so important i, I see why he added it into the book um and, it, and and what he links it to as well this will tie us in again to the main point in this chapter he links the will as flowing from that ego structure now uh, later in this in this summary i'm actually going to tie back to this point on this point of the will there's something actually important within that i want to draw out as well but i'll i'll leave that to a little bit later but um yeah so anyways the, he added these paragraphs um absolutely life-changing you know if you're trying to understand this book um and yeah I, i'll guess i'll leave this point at that but as i say there will be a, a follow-up point to, to come in a few minutes um so yeah the, this idea of the the two beings um, I've mentioned this in some other contexts. He did a lecture uh, February 11th, as a matter of fact, 1923, and I did a video about this on February 11th uh, this year, and I've embedded that video here, and it just expands a little bit more, it links some of this way of thinking with some of uh, Wilhelm Reich's science, and there's kind of a whole other conversation we could have about that, but I, I say I'll leave that, I'll leave that to be its own thing for another time and place. Um, yeah, I already mentioned the final chapter of the riddles of philosophy. That's another big anchor point that we can kind of link, you know, this whole thought process back in with. Like, it was actually when we read that in riddles of philosophy, it uh, really opened up my whole uh, interpretation of philosophy of freedom, you know, in a way that I hadn't seen before. So anyways, all these pieces, you can start tying them together and getting this much more clear anatomy of who the human being is and how they, you know, what they do in terms of the philosophy of freedom. Um, okay, so getting into some of the main content of the chapter, we have the driving force, the motive, the character, characterological disposition. I pulled out a couple of quotes here, which what I relate to is, you know, the, the three great books, you know, the book of nature, book of culture, book of spirit. So here's Steiner um, from this chapter. He says, I feel no compulsion, neither the compulsion of the book of nature which guides me by my instincts nor the compulsion of the moral commandments i.e the book of culture but i want simply to carry out what lies within me i.e the book of spirit and another similar quote the human being remains in his incomplete state unless he takes hold of the material for transformation within him and transforms himself through his own power nature makes of man merely a natural being society makes of him a law-abiding being only he himself can make himself a free man nature releases man from her fetters at a definite stage in his development society carries this development a stage further he alone can give himself the final polish and i have now there's a, a fairly lengthy uh, section in, in the middle of this chapter i'm just giving you uh, the headlines here there's he has a lot of explanation and detail you'll probably remember from reading this he what this is what i'm naming climbing the ladder of morality um so you know the lowest level instinctual perceiving what he calls the lower senses you can kind of evolve upwards to a level into the the feeling or percept driven mode of of action or the third level the thinking mental picture or what he calls practical experience so you know, we start to get a little bit more of the idea of intuition and drawing on concepts and things like that and finally he raises that to the the highest level what he calls um conceptual thinking free of any definite perceptual content or he uh he calls that practical reason uh, a concept derived from pure intuition so as i say i'm just giving the the headlines there as i say he has a, a fairly lengthy description of all of those things in the chapter and then as a counterpoint, as just after he does those four categories, he kind of gives these counter examples of um, what he calls either a philosopher of feeling or a philosopher of moral concepts. And again, just giving the headlines here, 
he talks that, like in the philosophy of feeling, he talks about this state of egoism, right? Th this attempt to act in the world in a way of gaining the greatest degree of pleasure for oneself, or under one acting under moral commandments, whether that's uh, you know an outer authority or the inner authority of one's conscience. Conscience, one is kind of acting by these these moral commandments, right? It's not it's not a it's not a free state. It's it's kind of this following some kind of form. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, the further path of development from there, he says, uh, the moral path of development goes from this kind of moral authority into one of moral insight. And here is his words on that. He says, it is a moral advance when man no longer simply accepts the commandment, sorry, the commands of an outer or inner authority as the motive of his action, but tries to understand the reason why a particular maxim of behavior should act as a motive in him. This is the advance from morality based on authority to action out of moral insight. And there's a couple of I'm gonna, just a couple of more uh, excerpts from him. I'm I kind of gave my own title to this. I call this striking the precise focal point of moral action where the driving force and motive coincide. Why I'm calling it a focal point. This is kind of the image that came to me as I read the excerpt. You'll see what I mean in a second. But he as he describes this, it's like you know, the the manual focus on a camera you know if you've ever done that of course our our, our phone cameras uh don't really do that they do it for us but when you have to manu manually focus it kind of reminds me of this quote and he says among the levels of character logical disposition we have singled out as the highest the one that works as pure thinking or practical reason among the motives we have just singled out conceptual intuition as the highest on closer inspection it will at once be seen that at this level of morality, driving force and motive coincide. That is, neither a predetermined character logical disposition nor the external authority of an accepted moral principle influences our conduct. It is an action determined purely and simply by its own ideal content. And similarly, in another place in the chapter, he says, man must unite his concept with the percept of man by his own activity. Concept and percept coincide in this case only if man himself makes them coincide. This he can do only if he has found the concept of the free spirit, that is, if he has found the concept of his own self. And then I have a, an external reference. Um, there's uh, you know, the whole, you know, the first main book of Wilhelm Reich where he talks about uh, character analysis, and I'm referring to his concept of the gen genital character type, which is really this state of health that, that Steiner is describing, you know, where, where this focal point comes in and we're actually acting out of the free spirit and we're kind of you know, doing all the, the goal of this book. So anyways, I'm, I'm looking to that external source for that. Um, and then, yeah, the main, the main kind of meat and potatoes of this chapter, really of the whole book, is the ethical individualist. Let's say we've, we've kind of read all the chapters up to now just to be ready for this. And... I don't know if I'll read every single quote here just for time, but I'll, I'll just at least start with this first one. He says, the sum of ideas which are effective in us, the concrete content of our intuitions constitute what is individual in each of us. Insofar as this intuitive content applies to action, it constitutes the moral content of the individual. To let this content express itself in life is both the highest moral driving force and the highest motive a man can have, who sees that in this content, all other moral principles are in the end united. We may call this point of view ethical individualism. So as I say, this could have been the beginning of the book, but it really couldn't because we had to prepare for it. Um, now there's, I say, I won't read all these excerpts. I wanna to get to my final section. He does, I'll just point out, he mentions here this big concept of the need for the love of the action. I am gonna explore that in a moment. Um, yeah, he talks about, you know, when you're in your lower instincts and everything, you're in, you you only belong to the general species of man, you know, that, that directly implies that we're each our own unique individual species, right? There's no, uh, you know, and again, like the rules that apply to the mass of humanity are that kind of lower form of humanity, not this higher form of individual intuition. Um, and as I say, I want to jump down into my final section. Yes, yeah, this is really the main, 
driving principle of the ethical individualist, you know, that a free action is a deed done out of love for the action. And I sat with this for a bit as I was going through the chapter and I was taking these notes and everything. It was like, okay, well, love is kind of a funny word, like, especially in English. It's like, well, what is it? Like, you know, we, we, it's, it's, it means so many things, right? We, you know, I, I love my spouse. I love, you know, I love pizza. I love the Boston Red Sox. I love whatever, you know, I, I can say I love, love, love all these different things, but what that word starts to be meaningless if it can mean all those different things. So, so we you can start to think of the four Greek words. You going back to you know the the Greek language of eros, storge, philia, and agape, and of course in Steiner's sense of love for the ethical individuals, we're getting much more up into this agape, this this higher sense of spiritual love. And to tie this all back to the very beginning where he added those extra paragraphs, I think this is the big um, you know the big payoff for me in this chapter of when we're asking. What is it to love a deed? You know, what kind of love are we talking about? We have to go back to that whole anatomy he laid out for us, and this difference between you know this this um, you know the core spirit being that participates living thinking versus the outer shell of the ego, you know, the ego structure. That it's it's that love of that, that love. Uh, well, first of all, it's a self love, but it's that that spirit being's capacity for this higher agape love which is the the love of the deed that we're really going for so, right so it's it's that or and the other thing the other language i put in here as i put in my notes i call this the the you know an act of conation you know, normally when we're talking about will you know it is my will to do this or do that um we have to be again this is another language thing we have to be very careful with most of what we usually use in language and most of what we're talking about is is the the will which is called volition you know I, I do something you know uh with my volition or against my volition or whatever that you know that's one kind of will but this this deeper form of of the spirit being of love has the other kind of will which is a word that's kind of fallen out of english and that's the word conation and anyway that that could be a whole interesting topic to open up but but i kind of had to go through this whole exercise for myself to really start to get a sense of yeah what is he actually talking about when he talks about love of the deed you know so so this is kind of the little the little exercise and the little conclusion i came to about that so i will leave the summary at that and as i say i put i put it into the chat you can get any of my articles and references i put in there and yeah that's that's all i would say for the summary okay. thanks so much jeff really rich um so much going on in this chapter. He did a great job um, highlighting, putting it in context. Um, the the thing I wanted to share that occurs to me, particularly with your um, point at the end about love and which kind of love and these different Greek terms. And throughout this chapter, I mean, and throughout the whole book, and this came up earlier um, in one of the earlier chapters, it's clear that Steiner is in many ways um, trying to render or translate a New Testament understanding um, of, of ethics into contemporary terms. Um, and so, you know, and what he's talking about in this chapter, the difference between law and action out of love or love for the objective um, reminded me so much of a chapter in Matthew chapter 22, um, particularly verses 36 through 40, where this is the King James translation, um, Jesus is asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law, and the prophets and as is often said you know what jesus brings and adds to the old testament emphasis on, emphasis on law is this importance of of love right um and the the greek in the new testament for love is agape unconditional love which i think fits the unconditional nature of the sort of free d that that steiner is talking about So 
anyone would anyone interested in chiming in comments questions go ahead max yeah thanks thanks matt and thanks jeff i would uh i was just going to uh build a little bit off of some of the points that jeff brought forward uh specifically about the question of what it means to that that like fundamental theory of the free human being uh, to you know act out of love for the action, and um, I think one of the challenges that also uh, Jeff kind of illuminated for us is the mood of this chapter is logicism, and whereas we are constrained to try to like ex explicate this verbally, that will always be sequential. Uh, the logis the lo log uh, the logicism view it's something comprehensive like a uh, synchronic vision and so there's a way in which all these things hang together and we will start at any part and it will it will be hard that you can't draw everything together at one time if you try to explain it and I think that's part of the reason also this chapter had somewhat of a like rambling feel and because Steiner is trying to convey a um, sort of epiphanic uh, vision of how all these ideas hang together uh, but so uh, one, but on, on the other hand, you're you have to start somewhere. And so I guess uh, the way that I have understood the point about love for the action is um, if you consider actions from instinct, for instance, uh, we can't really love those actions because we don't actually know them fully. Like, uh, and by that, I mean, we have to distinguish between an action and a, and a, a mere event. Uh, uh, and in the case of, a, of the instinct, we actually know it primarily as an event and then only subsequently appropriate that to ourselves. Whereas um, if you imagine like a spectrum almost, and the instinct is on the, the far end of the spectrum, the kind of dim end, well then on the, the illuminated end are the deeds that, that flow forth from, a, uh, from pure thinking. Uh, those, are, those, those actions are entirely uh, known to us in the sense of we can actually we can actually embody them and become one with them because they are transparent to us through our thinking and and so uh, the the point about like you can't love something that you uh, that is entirely outside of your understanding uh, whereas an action an action that comes that flows forth from that kind of lucid part of your being uh, that's something you can actually then sort of um, you know, attempt to realize, and Steiner uses the example of the way that, I think he even uses the example of the way that a, like a, a parent wants to realize the fruition of, of uh, his or her child, uh, the deeds, we bear that relation to them. Um, but what I picture actually is like, you could, and Steiner alludes to this here, I think he, he uh, like fleshes it out more in a different book, probably the foundation or study of man or foundation of human experience there's like a continuum or a spectrum of will. And you can imagine that it like indexing that spectrum to the, uh, as a kind of an analogy to the, the visible spectrum on the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And you can picture like on to the one side you have instinct. And if you went further towards that, uh, picturing like the, the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, if you went further down the side of in instinct uh, in the analogy it would be like infrared, you would end up with just like force uh, and uh, like a, a phenomenon of physics, pure physics. Um, and then, then you realize as force enters into human experience, it becomes, or well, life, as force enters into life, it becomes first instinct. Uh, and you know, these, the terminology, it's always stipulative. So there's probably better words than this, but if you imagine a sort of gradient mapping it onto the, the color spectrum, you could think of something like instinct, urge, drive, desire, wish, intention, resolution, something like that. And again, the terminology is not that important, but I hope the, the concept is clear that as you move towards, you know, from one end of the spectrum to the other end, you are moving into a place in which the human being is actually, like you're moving further away from the idea of blind force and towards the idea that the human being is actually like an active, and not just in some sort of abstract or like some sort of uh, metaphorical uh, new age sense, but the human being is actually actively 
participating in the evolution of the universe and the universe is not something separate from the physical universe it's like this is one world uh and i think uh, at least for me as i sat with these ideas and tried to um try to attain to this like comprehensive or synchronic vision then uh it's i started to see how it uh hung together and hope something i've said you know will either spark discussion or maybe disagreement and then i can learn something yeah, thanks, Max. I really did appreciate the points Donner was making about uh, perception, like the three levels of um, human life. I think he described them as in the perception, perceiving being initially at the at the lowest level, and how in many cases there's a sort of um, reaction to a perception that that bypasses not only thinking but also even feeling. Um, so not only do we not think about how to respond to the perception uh, by bringing in the appropriate concept, but there's not even in these sorts of instinctual reactions, there's not even room there for us to feel it. <laughs> it's just this immediate um, chain reaction, like force, like you're saying. Um, hey, Jeff, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Jesus, I think I'm going to try this. Um, um, building on what Max was saying, or maybe exploring what Max was saying, some new thoughts were arising as relates to um, the ground of being, say. And there's a lot of claims that people make about the ground of being, but I think Max was hitting on something here that may be related to this moment in the chapter when he describes the cessation of the, the, the cognitive physiological, psychophysiological organism that is that gives way to thinking and in a sense um well then and then not only that but then he says thinking itself represses this activity this i would say maybe something like blind force um that is just inherent in what it is to be a living organism with a uh, and then and then and then a human living organism with a neurological and uh neurocardiological functioning just just pulsating and i get this so that i i came away from that feeling like is this what we're talking about in a certain sense in relation in, in relationship to what what um max was saying um so uh then the, then the another image came to me as i was reading this and i was thinking is it possible to think of intuition and thinking on on different ends of a pole so there's a polarity themselves and intuition is receptivity like like perception is to observation or observation is to perception whatever and then uh thinking is that that constant activity and i get the picture of the maypole for some reason this came to me so you have this uh this this body this the other thing he says in this chapter is that um the the body is necessary for for the eye consciousness to uh um arise and it, and it and it doesn't have to it doesn't stay uh, a slave to the body it it becomes something independent in and of itself and so you get this feeling of this erect uh, verticality that just it arises up and then there's this weaving together between in opposite directions between intuition and thinking until you've got the the sort of dressed personality of a of a of a more and more individualized and and individually expressed human being uh, i think that was yeah i can see steiner sort of um trying to inherit and build on as much as possible some of von Hartmann's insights about the role of character and what he ends up calling subjective dispositions in in shaping our capacity to to translate motive into action um and it seems that uh where Steiner disagrees with von Hartmann is that we do have this intuitive thinking capacity by which uh ideas can become by which motive and driving force can become identical and that seems to be where von hartmann thinks where, where steiner and von hartmann part ways and i mean that's that's a crucial issue um it's it seems um 
in in further following Max's thought there, as you astutely are, are um, describing what Steiner is trying to do, that um, that potentially this is a question I suppose I've always had um, is um, um, an intuition that's individualized to the degree that one can wield it freely. Is that transformed instinct? Is that a, is that, I mean, instinct is a, an expression of this blind force, perhaps, Max, or or something along those lines. And, and it, it already has a, a cognitive function in, in its ability to act with with some some degree of coherence, say. So I guess that's a that's a that's a follow up and a question. The way that I was visualizing it is instinct is like the first order of internalization or inwardization of this blind force. It's like when the blind force is drawn inwards or inwardized by life, then you can imagine like successive inwardizations as the instinct transforms into a higher, more increasingly conscious action as it transforms into, you know, like drive, desire, motive, wish, intention resolution, et cetera. This is like that blind force actually becoming increasingly, you know, spiritualized in a sense. And that actually happens not, you know, not somewhere outside of us, but rather through us. Mm -hmm. May I, um, because I think um, this goes to the, the uniquely human, um, the Maypole picture again, the uniquely human um, um, experience of thinking as intuitive and, um, and I'm wondering if this sort of godhead of force that is that is a sort of ground of being as we've identified as thinking is more of a, um, pardon the, the sort of, um, I don't know, maybe oversimplistic terminology, but more of a, um, a divine feminine receptivity as knowing, as coming to know um, through, through receptivity, through the receptivity side of that, of that pole, and then being able to incorporate this uh the, this uh this force and turn it into something conscious and the the, the result between the two is again this uh, to, to be the to be the dead pole is uh is this eye in the in the center um Kate, I saw your hand go up and come down. Did you want to hold off for now or? Um, no, I'll go into it. But, uh, my... um, okay, what have I got here? Okay, so I was thinking about in a New Testament way. Um, this is my, this is my body, eat it. This is my blood, drink it. Um, and I was thinking about how, in a way, the way that the, the way that spiritual thinking supplants the bodies, the organization, the bo organization of the body, and in it um, creates the ego consciousness. And we're looking at things in this polarity. So it's sort of the polar of taking in food and building up your body. And um, this like the rumination like a cow ruminates on the grass on its cud and it really knows the world through that it eats the grass and assimilates the grass into its body in this very long rhythmic process is that not similar to how we ruminate on moral maxims um to know about them more fully and in that way know about the world and in that way, sustain our life, sustain our consciousness, which doesn't need, in a way that doesn't need food, which is sort of pointed to in the New Testament, especially I've been reading a book by someone who is one of the founding um, people of the Christian community. And he's talking about Jesus and talking about the things that he says to his disciples and this idea that this is why this chapter makes me nervous because all of these things that to me I've always thought of as kind of metaphors are becoming more real. This idea that you could um, supplant your need for instinct altogether 
if you became fully receptive to the other pole and you could live on love alone you know you could uh, live on the love of jesus alone it sounds like uh, it's like it makes me nervous because it sounds kind of it makes me feel nuts but um, it's just that idea of the rumination of the cow the rumination of moral maxims um and we we're talking about this the instinctual force and the intuitive intuitive receptivity and those images come together and I put my hand down because I didn't know if it sounded nuts or not and I didn't know if it really if this is a good way to continue the conversation or not because I think people are having good ideas really working it out before I yeah bring in um this uh this ruminations I've been having about um Christ <laughs> and Christ in me and um this nervousness about how do I how do I know I want to go back to the knowing chapters the, the the idea chapters because it's how do I know that it's that it's love that it's charity that it's intuition I mean there's so many things that that not that and get in the way and it's such a vibrating tangle of different things that influence my character and different ways that I can convince myself that I'm acting in a free way but then I could reflect on that and go mm -hmm. but I guess the important point is that we could take this um, intuitive pulse so far that we could relinquish the need for the instinctual pole together Well, Kate, if that's crazy, I'm ready to jump off the deep end with you, um, because the what you're you, the the way that you're connecting the sort of the Eucharist and the eating and the the ruminating and digestion of the moral maxims, so as to uh, understand them well enough that we might get to the point where we can freely act in that way rather than just obeying a law or something because we're supposed to and other people expect us to or whatever. Um, I think that's exactly what's at stake here. And the questions you're asking and the doubts that are arising about how do you know, um, that's part of the digestion. I mean, that's just part of rumination, right? And um, I think that's a, that's exactly the the path. That's exactly the questions that Steiner's proposing that we that we chew on. <laughs> so I really appreciate what you shared there. Um, Jonathan and then uh, Nicholas. Go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, uh, towards the, uh, sort of response to Kate, just uh, not not sort of directly answering anything, but just the, the, uh, towards the end of the chapter, he reminds us that we're generally a mix, you know, um, not pure intuition. Although I might suppose that Jesus Christ was an example of that in in sort of action um, um and um there's I mean there's 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 so much here but what really struck me in studying this chapter again was what what would be the difference between love of the deed and then normal sort of love um uh, 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 one's um, emotional attachment, because it's only through our feelings that um, we relate ourselves to the world. But here he's suggesting that there can be a moment where instead of, you know, it's like, oh, I like this, or I, I don't like that, instead that that it's the deed. So somehow I think in, in that moment, oneself has disappeared in a sense, because you're not, it's not, you know, do I like this or I like that, but there's something, you know, that it's about the deed and somehow we disappear in that. So we're not so important. It's very hard to kind of, as you know, um, Jeff and Max are saying to sort of put these into to words because it's all there but um and maybe just to finish in, in, in sort of thinking about jesus and and can't sort of interpreted i think that kind of 
thing as the greatest possible good for everyone. So um, th th then here we're presented with the exact opposite, which is kind of the, the tiniest, most singlest good. You know, that the, just that which only you can do now in this situation. So it might not have any relevance, you know, beyond uh, uh, like that immediate second, or it, it might, um, you know, the, the question of the greatest possible good doesn't necessarily come into it. And it, it's really striking how, you know, he doesn't say it's not a question of the judge, the final criterion, some might say it has to be, is it, yes, I've got an idea of what to do, but is it good or evil? That doesn't even come in. That that can only be sort of um, will go down in the annals of history after the moment is made. And I, I, I'd just like to say one more thing. I, I was trying to think of a, a, an example of, of what would be um, this kind of situation. And um, the example I came to, which is very relevant, it's like a hundred years since um, Rudolf Steiner's sort of spiritual activity began as a teacher when he was asked to, to present um, it, 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 in a more sort of uh, Christian presentation what otherwise was coming in the Theosophical Society, in a more Eastern presentation. That began his sort of teaching career. And then that was deepened when someone asked him, can you bring us the new mysteries? So the ancient mysteries... Um, had to come to an end. The ancient sort of spiritual guidance of humanity had come to an end. And someone said to him, can we have the new mysteries? And so he made, again, someone asked him, and, and, and this is, you know, this is the deed. It's, it's in cognition, we kind of say, what's going on here? But in, in the deed, we say, what shall I do here? And so people gave him these questions and he, he gave some kind of answers and it was not going so well. And then he got to the point where he had to he he had this quandary. There's a rule in 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 initiates that you don't engage in public activity. So he could be a teacher. He never joined the Anthroposophical Society. He was never a member or anything like that. He was a teacher, and then other people could you know glean something from him and, and act in the world. But the spiritual teacher had to remain aloof. And he saw that the world is in a certain state. And out of his love, he came to this point where he's kind of like, so this isn't everything that I'm bringing and the spiritual world is trying to bring through me is not working. And yet the, the rules say, I, I cannot become a member and do these things in the world. What shall I do? And so he has that question, what shall I do now? And he had to, the, 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 the whole ruins, uh, rules from, from all the way back, from eons back said, you can't do, you can't enter into it yourself. You have to stand aloof. This is for others. And he, he was faced with a decision and, and he did not know if it was right or wrong, if the universe would say, oh, Oh my God! You know, if he, what you have done is 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 a disaster, or or if it would be quite the opposite. Yeah, As I think there's widespread agreement. I would hope that the stage of moral development uh, of just sort of obeying the law, whether that's uh, criminal law or or moral maxims and whatnot, that that's not the highest uh, form of moral development. I think most people would accept that. The difficulty comes in for explaining where the exceptions are justified. And I see, you know, Steiner's trying to spell that out. Um, <clears throat> Nicholas, go ahead. Uh oh, I don't hear your audio. I don't know if you have the right mic selected. Uh, How about now? There you go. <clears throat> um, so I was um, spurred to raise my hand, uh, I guess, by what I heard in Kate's contribution. 
about vulnerably struggling with the question that then Jonathan um, spoke to, and I think Matt, you just spoke to it a little bit too, which is like we can we can come to this place or think that we come to this place of uh, meeting uh, whatever this intuitive thinking is. Um, but it's <laughs> speaking from 20 years of experience, it's not a simple matter at all to live that. Um, so Matt, you mentioned uh, the, the issue of, you know, whether, whether law incorporates the highest morality and I think it's really clear that it doesn't but I, I gotta say I found Steiner's treatment of that point in the book it was a little unsatisfying he he says something like you know I'm talking about living from this from this intuition that's beyond any moral code but could actually include any moral code as as I heard it so to Jonathan's um you know it, it's the opposite of Kant I I'm not a philosopher and I don't know Kant, but but it seems to be any like particular moral stance that we could say, well, after the fact, I could say, well, this was because it was for the highest good in another case, because it was for my highest good in another case, you know, so all these, all these uh, a posteriori um, justifications could be true, could be applicable could be the actual origin of the guidance or intuition to, to follow the act in the world. But there's no particular rule for saying which one is going to apply, right? It's It comes from the beyond. So, so Steiner says something like, you know, people object to this because it could just be used for criminal action. And he says, well, that, you know, don't worry about that because criminal action doesn't come from this place, <laughs> right? But that doesn't actually answer the question, right? I mean... Still, like, given a law, if I obey it or don't obey it, where was that coming from? Um, so it's 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 really hard. I mean, I'm just just reminded. I think Jeff referred in an earlier discussion to the epistemology of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit in the spiritual framework I work in has a very particular like meaning and function. I don't know if that's the same meaning as Jeff used it or the same meaning, but that Steiner uses it with, but uh, uses it for, but it, it's to do with um, ethical, moral guidance for life, and also a function of relinquishing the fragmentation in the world. And uh, uh, just to, to, I'm going to stop right after this, just to to link to the theme of of Christ, which has been very alive. Uh, beautifully in this discussion you know my own experience is that trying to live with and from that place of the holy spirit which i more or less identify with this uh intuitive thinking or conceptual intuition i'm sure i'm using the wrong technical uh words but it, it, it is more or less a crucifixion <laughs> to 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 try to live from with and deeper into that place so i, I really appreciate uh just and I'm kind of on a personal note, kind of blown away by jumping into this chapter and finding uh, myself in a context of like the deepest place of my spiritual process. So I just wanted to, you know, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. And you know, I just would briefly say that I think Steiner's response to the potential objection that this gives free reign to criminals to break the law and say, well, it it was my intuitive. Uh, uh, thinking that led me to do it. There's all often, uh, well, so gosh, there's so much to say here, but it, you could also just say that um, it's possible for laws to be passed that um, and enforced that are not actually in alignment with the good. I mean, that happens all the time. Um, and I'll just note that I think Steiner's attempt to say what I'm talking about here is rooted in a conception of morality that's more like a natural history of morality because it it's the 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 deeds of individuals has led to our conception of morality, not some system of moral law that's been just dropped in from heaven, right? Um, and so there's a deep trust in humanity's ability 
first of all, to just have this instinct for sociality that we can trust, that we get along with each other because we have a uh, similar organization, but also a trust that we can cultivate this freedom. Um, and that when there is crime, um, which, you know, even I don't think he as an anarchist would think that that just disappears when you get rid of all the ways that the state and law contributes to crime, actually. Um, but he, I think, imagines that um, he just has the trust in human nature that it wouldn't be at least worse than it is now. As human beings can drop to this more instinctual genus level uh, where the motives from for action arise potentially in criminal ways. Um, but anyways, much longer conversation there that we don't have time to get into right now. I'll hand it over to Angus. Um, yeah, I feel myself in the same situation as Matt was um, describing. So much to say, so many really interesting contributions coming right from the get-go with, uh, with Jeff and all the way through. I'm going to try and pick up on something that Jeff mentioned right at the beginning because um, it felt essential for me in the chapter, but I, I want to also try and link it to what Jeff and Kate and uh, and also Nicholas uh, were saying, and perhaps other people, I might have forgotten it in the process. So one of the, the strongest pictures for me in this um, in this chapter is actually the foot sinking into the mud right at the beginning, because he uses this picture so powerfully and also there even just the fact that it's a foot it's also it's like in, in steiner terms it's the will it's the will acting and how does he use this how does he use this picture he says that this thinking activity it's like it imprints itself on the um on the physical organization labor's organization and it, this is what in he calls this. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I had a quick look in the English. He uses the German word "gegen built like an impression, so like the the opposite, it's like the, the the impression that's left in the mud, and then compares that to that being where um, our. Our, our concept of ourselves arises so like the concept of i actually arises in this like thinking activity it's like pressing itself down into the physical um organization and then also very importantly in, in my mind it's like saying that that this once this deed has been done and the i awareness has been created for this thinking activity it is no longer bound to the body that actual i consciousness and i think why that's so important so interesting um in relation to what's been talked about later is um when when uh, kate was talking about references to um to, to the Bible and then and then Nicholas as well, my mind went straight to um, John four, the water, living water, it's like when when he's at the well, and then and then the bread of life. These images, these words that he uses, these ideas of like something eternal. And then when I think back to this thinking activity that has created first of all my awareness of the I in the body. But as I try to connect more and more with that original, that, that creator of my own activity, remember we, we, we learned like I live by the grace of thinking. Um, this becomes an even more direct experience in this picture for me and this use of like how an impression is created, but that this, this impression then gains its own life within the thinking activity. And that if I, try to deepen myself in that activity, referring back to another catch word that's like come up the exceptional state, this discovering, it's like thinking through the activity of thinking, then I really do begin to sense something immortal in me, something eternal. 
And that is, that's food for my soul. That's food that's like talks to me of everlasting life. That is for me, one way of understanding what he's talking about, what uh, John is talking about in, 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 uh, in, in the fourth, uh, in the fourth chapter and, uh, in sixth chapter. Um, so yeah, this, uh, I've got so like funny little drawings here for my, for my foot, but, uh, that's, that's where I really went with this, this will activity. So like landing in the body and then creating something, um, a new spiritual in potentially independent free being. So thanks all of you for helping me to so like pull those together a little bit in my, in my thinking. Yeah. Thanks for that contribution, Angus. Um, yeah, I'll, in the interest of time, not, not comment further and, uh, give Chad a chance to, uh, to chime in and, uh, we'll wrap it up after that. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thanks everyone, Jeff, everyone's contributions. Um, I really read this uh, chapter. It was the best chapter so far for me. Um, and I, I read it, uh, through an archetypal lens, through a planetary archetypal lens primarily. And, um, through through the evolution of consciousness as well it it seems like steiner didn't he didn't articulate a lot of that dimension the evolution of consciousness in a lot of ways but a couple of points he did where like what matt was just saying um about the or i think you were saying the organization of like we, we all share in the organization of the body but he also says the organization or the connection to the ideal content is what we all share and um but I was like, when I'm hearing him describe perceiving our instincts as like the driving force, that's, that's the Pluto archetype. It's the, in, the, the unconscious, the instinctual primary, like sexual instincts, hunger, that's Pluto. And then as we moves into like, um, I guess, character disposition, but also when he specifically um, calls out like tact and moral good taste, that's the superego. It's the Saturn function. And like, um, and, and then ultimately like, it seems it's the relationship between these two over time, which he also says that like, you know, the evolution of morality, he doesn't, maybe he doesn't phrase it that way, but that, you know, laws and what we adhere to in society and civilization, that they've all been created by individual free people like heads of states or whatever, but they were ultimately doing that. He th suggests in the same way that he's describing here that, you know, ultimately we don't want to be beholden to any external law, but what I, the way I read it was that the id, the plutonic instinct is the driving force, but then it's in relationship to the superego, our conscience, our sense of right and wrong. And as we evolve, we are developing more uh, qualities of moral good taste that, that, that um, the superego function can become more of a like a comprehensive kind of un, like um, guidance for us, but that also evolves in relationship to the instincts and our ego and the I that is making the intuitive uh, judgments in relationship to the ideal in the course of the evolution of consciousness. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I was um, seeing the chapter reading by and that it's, I mean, cause he, he, he also says that there was a time when we perhaps needed to live by external moral laws, but that like um, laws of governing laws in society and civilization, but that we're moving more towards a place where individual free men, human beings are deciding what those goods are ultimately. Um, is that, does that resonate with some of the way you read the chapter or 
I'm not sure if I articulated that quite the way I, just, I wanted sorry, to. I didn't think of it in that way, but um, it's given me a lot of thought. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the sun and the moon as another version of that. Um, mm -hmm. so the sun being, what is that? That consciousness, that, that um, idea realm that everyone shares and the moon being everyone's um, individual reflection of that. And it, mm. the moon is transient in that way as well. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm also I'm gonna do a archetypal analysis of Steiner's natal chart and transits uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Hawaii time, uh, it'd be 11 a.m. Pacific. And uh, I'll put the Zoom link and the email thread so everyone has uh, access to it. So um, yeah, I thought it would be good to share some of these ideas in direct relationship to seeing his birth chart and his transits for like when he wrote Philosophy of Freedom. And, and then you guys, with your understanding of Steiner's biography in deeper ways than I do, can reflect on it. And we can go deeper into it as, as it organically evolves. So yeah thanks again it's it's really i feel like i feel like he really laid his cards out in this chapter um relative to what the responsibility is in us to develop the intuitive capacities and relationship to our own sense of moral dimension and, and to me that i think that what i was trying to get to is that like like Saturn is both the law and the world and the governing and this authority figures, that's everything, but it's also our own sense of what's right and wrong. And we're developing that in relationship to our intuitive sense and that that moral compass, our conscience, is evolving in relationship to our thinking. And it becomes more instantiated relative to how we evolve over time. And it incorporates it. So it becomes... um not sure how he words this, but it becomes like more of a a new level. I think he describes it as within the tact or um, what it says a moral good taste that that's, it evolves in relationship to the instincts and the intuitive thinking over time. But yeah, sorry, I took it so late. No, it's all good, Chad. <clears throat> um, I'm glad you announced your... Uh archetypal analysis of of Steiner's chart tomorrow I'm really looking forward to that and I I definitely like what you're saying and I would I would add to to what you're saying um and then we'll call it quits for today uh that kind of what Steiner is doing is in a way Kant you could understand as Saturn sort of personified as the, the idea of the moral law whether external moral maxims or the conscience which commands us and steiner saying that his view is the opposite of kant's not that the moral law doesn't matter but i see steiner as sort of introducing basically to use the planetary archetypes uh uranus and neptune right exactly uranus for sure yeah yeah and neptune is the the spiritual world of ideas that we all participate in and can can gain a sense of um, our uh, capacity to transform Pluto or, or the, the will from an unconscious instinctual state into um, and bring it into unity with, with motives that are ideas or ideals that are conscious. Um, so yeah, it's a helpful translation, I think, to get at what Steiner's saying. Yeah, and I think that'll all become more clear when we see it in his birth chart, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Look forward to that. All right, friends, really, really great session. Appreciate all of your contributions and uh, we'll see you next week. If anyone wants to uh, introduce chapter 10, let us know. All right, see you next time. Bye everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. Have a nice week. Yeah, have a great week. Love.